This is the fourth topic in Enterprise and Governance and I want to turn attention in this topic to the deep historical uh, background discussion of the rise of trade over distance, the rise of merchants and the relationships of merchant classes, emergent merchant classes to uh, power holders, particularly those who dominated uh, societies historically through the use of military force and to raise some basic issues about how we manage to have so much trade uh, over long distances despite the huge problems of predation, of, of theft, of, of the complete lack of long distance uh, uh, authoritative force that could enforce, for example, contracts and, and property rights. There are some ways in which trading can happen despite uh, deep insecurities and risks to uh, assets and uh, even the, uh, uh, the life, the well-being of people involved uh, directly in enterprise. So this will set some uh, context within which we engage with our textbook, the book. Uh, the Company, Short History of a Revolutionary Idea, it opens in its first chapter uh, with a discussion of some very early instances of people raising capital to take advantage of long distance trade and particularly referencing uh, Roman examples and then subsequent examples um, into the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period. So let's have a like, little bit of a look at some of the background there. Uh, so the first thing I've done in uh, this slide set, which you have available through uh, Moodle, is uh, to pull together from some third parties, and thank you to those third parties, uh, some visualizations of historical trade routes. And one of the things that very quickly becomes clear when we look at the history of trade is technology. And technology in its uh, geographical context is hugely important. And in particular, the technology of moving things, moving heavy things over considerable distances, uh, really until the uh, development of the railways and then the internal combustion engine uh, and the steam engine, uh, which gave us the powertrains, the ability to literally move mountains out of the way, to dig tunnels, uh, to flatten lands, to lay down railways, to create decent roads. Uh, so much trade in volume happened through water. Uh, lit literally, like anyone who's a good swimmer knows, um, the art of swimming to a critical degree depends on the recognition that you will float. You won't float if you panic. Uh, you'll sink yourself, um, but you will float. And uh, in a sense, what we say, therefore, is let the water do the work that uh, if we create vessels which uh, have an effective displacement that allow us to carry heavy cargoes, uh, to float heavy cargoes on the water, um, we only need then to harness the power of the wind with sails or row, rowing crews or subsequently with steam, steam boats, of course, um, in the, uh, the 19th century. Um, but the critical thing is it was waterways that allowed the rise of long distance trade. And the Mediterranean is a critical uh, center. Uh, and this actually has been very well uh, studied by scholars such as uh, um, Braudel, uh, a French uh, renowned uh, economic historian uh, who gave great attention to the role of the Mediterranean as a cradle of um, Western civilization, but but much larger than than Western civilization, equally uh, uh, Arab civilization, and the critical interdependence of uh, trade and uh, cultural innovation uh, throughout the greater Mediterranean uh, area. So we've got some sense of the the map here, some of the trade links, and uh, we see uh, evolution over time of these these trade links. Uh, more and more uh, rise of inland trade as well as roads were built and particularly when you had a rise of political authority at a certain time that at least in over certain distances could bring some security to people involved in trade. 
Romans, of course, were renowned for building roads. They recognized that uh, the great hinterland offered uh, plenty of resources and opportunities. So typically the building of roads was a mechanism for extending the reach of trade from waterways. Uh, so you would have seaborne trade, you would then have trade uh, that went up and down rivers, and then the rivers could only get you so far, so you would join up uh, the other areas, areas that could not be connected uh, through waterborne trade uh, with slowly improving roads. We do know in the Middle medieval era that uh, many roads uh, fell into disrepair in certain, certain areas, and we see reductions in trade over certain distances. The seaboard trade tends to continue to be uh, quite important, even with uh, the uh, fragmentation of Europe, uh, with the fall of Rome, for instance. Now, in referencing Rome, uh, we still see some legacies uh, today in European languages uh, from Latin and particular terms that arose in relation to economics, um, economic in activities, trading activities, and carry over to uh, terms that we use routinely in European Western languages uh, about business. One of the, uh, the first things we note about Rome is, of course, uh, Rome was a great military power. Uh, of course, it inherited so much of Greek civilization, and so it was a great cultural power as well, Greco-Roman civilization. Um, but the very act of actually uh, having large-scale military mobilization capability to be, to be able to put armies in the field and have them over great distances and to rule a large empire um, also needed a lot of logistical support. So wherever an army goes, uh, merchants uh, must follow. Um, as provisioners, literally to provide the, uh, the equipment, um, the food and all of those things um, that uh, armies are going to need with them. And so there's always a tension uh, between the social order which me might be tied towards the status of the warrior, the soldier, uh, and the dependence of a military class on the supporting infrastructure of trade and merchants and over time as that scales up of finance mechanisms to uh, to fund large scale large scale trade and we see a very similar tension in the tokugawa period for example in japan an increasing tension um, between the status of uh, samurai who were uh, paid based in rice stipends uh, and the rise of a merchant class who, although they had relatively low social status uh, relative to the samurai class, of course, uh, they had increasing economic uh, influence. So we see in a much earlier period in uh, Rome, the Roman Empire, a uh, similar kind of tension. I've got some terms here in the slides. Um, we simply refer to that and you can look through these yourselves. Uh, but particularly the, uh, the financiers at the time, larger scale financiers at the time, um, and uh, forgive my Latin pronunciation, but then negotiatores. <laughs> and... No, I won't have a second go at that. Bear with me, you can read it. Uh, no, we'll look at negoci... Uh, ne negoci... Yeah, negotiatores. Maybe? Okay. Uh, one of the problems with Latin is people pronounce it uh, typically inspired or influenced by the native tongue, whether they're a French or a German or a Spanish or an Italian or an English speaker. Um, Latin was long since no longer a compulsory subject when I was in school. Uh, it was for my dad, uh, though, having been Catholic educated. Um, so, of course, we still uh, use the notion of the negociant uh, in French, uh, which uh, is a merger who typically is, is a trader, but also brings a financial dimension. And agents as well, still we have in English as well, uh, providing business representation services. And then smaller scale merchants, as the uh, terms suggest as well, the mercatores, um, they, they were typically of a lower status, and, but they played critical roles, um, running markets, being retailers, all of those kind of things that keep um, urban uh, environments working. 
And uh, what we see is with the scale of enterprise, um, even some of the wealthiest of the financiers uh, had to pool funds from elsewhere. And this is touched on in our textbook. And by the way, let me make these slides rather bigger so you can see them uh, yourselves. Then the need to scale up uh, enterprise meant that you needed to raise capital from a number of people. And uh, mechanisms that were developed to do this, uh, particularly uh, centred um, on this notion of the societatis, the, uh, which is now in French, societe, um, so a society, uh, and we still use that term in French, for example, in relation to finance, um, so an, an incorporated company uh, has this notion. So bringing a number of people together, a group of people, um, in order to share the risk, raising, raising finance from a number of people and then sharing the risk involved with it. Now, interestingly, in the Roman context, and we see this happening in many other places as well, uh, something equivalent to a company, privileged individuals bringing other people together, um, typically were doing so to invest in a business opportunity that, that typically was received from the state uh, or the, the equivalent of the state, the military, the rulers of the day. So uh, providing military services uh, or ne um, needed materials to the military uh, was, was obviously a key, key role. Uh, but also, and this is something, it's a little, little strange to modern audiences, but was extraordinarily common until a couple of centuries ago in a lot of societies. Uh, the practice of tax farming. Uh, typically rulers um, and what their nascent state, the, their governments, uh, they only had a very small public service, as it were, the, serv the servants of the emperor, the king or whatever. And so actually taxing an economy over great distances uh, was a rather difficult thing to do. Uh, of course, they're always raising taxes uh, to pay for wars and, and whatnot, uh, sometimes in a, in a more positive vein for um, infrastructure provision, uh, but a lot of money went to warring. So one mechanism for raising tax was to actually auction off the right to collect, ta collect tax. Uh, so someone would actually bid for the right to collect tax in a certain area and uh, then they would have to go out there and actually realise this. They would actually have to put people on the ground, um, normally with weapons to protect themselves because who wants to pay tax? Uh, if you go into a village in a remote place and say, give me your money, um, you're just as likely to not make it out of there again alive. Uh, so you had to go with a considerable force. So you often have to raise a, um, a merchant um, army, pay some people to, to work for you. Um, and from the ruler's point of view, selling off the right to collect taxes was very efficient because they got paid up front. And as a basic information asymmetry, this is a critical thing. We, we talk about decision making and the structure of contracts um, in, in business. And we'll talk a lot about this throughout the course. But actually, taxation has this most elementary problem that the rulers, whether in Rome or wherever they are, uh, really don't know how many goats does someone have, how much wine are they making, how many wine presses do they have, you know, how many olive trees and uh, how much olive oil are they pressing, how much soap are they making and selling. All of that information is actually rather difficult to gather. And you would need uh, a lot of people working for you. You have to pay for them. Um, and nonetheless, there was there are going to be agency problems because those people on the ground are just as likely to take a bribe to significantly uh, understate, to under-report. Okay, so you're going to need lots of surveillance mechanisms. So auctioning the right to collect taxes actually made a certain sense. And we see this in many places. Uh, we see that the kings of in Thailand, in Siam, in, in Ayutthaya, for example, um, and sub subsequently uh, in uh, Bangkok, um, all did this, and uh, one of the controversial things sometimes is that they actually assigned the rights to collect tax, tax farming, uh, sometimes to foreigners, and this would, of course, create um, even more uh, discontent. Another circumstances in which we see something equivalent to the early company being created 
to take advantage of government favours is when the government gives a monopoly. This is, in some respects, um, similar to the tax farming. Uh, if, it's, if it's a necessary good and, uh, you know, people are going to be buying it, of course, one thing to do is the, the king, the ruler, can just simply put a tax on it, a salt tax, for example, or a mill tax or whatever, okay? Um, a wine tax. Uh, people are going to drink wine, so let's tax the wine. And we get that, and this still happens today. Um, these excise, these tariffs, taxes that apply to uh, a whole range of goods in demand, very common on, for example, cigarettes and, and whatnot as well. So rather than just go through the, the complex process of trying to keep track of who's trading what, um, uh, all of those different sellers and try and raise tax from all of them, one th kind of lazy thing that governments could do would be just simply to declare a monopoly. They would just give a right to only one business person to sell a particular product. And uh, like the tax farming, you could auction off that right. You could uh, auction off the royal monopoly. And we see this throughout history. This becomes very common in the Middle Ages for a mechanism for rulers to favor their um, strong supporters. Um, in the case of uh, Queen Elizabeth, for example, her um, favorite dandy um, at the royal court until he uh, got a bit beyond himself and eventually fell out of favor. Um, he was um, granted the monopoly on importing wines from Spain, particularly sweeter wines uh, from Spain, which was uh, a hugely lucrative thing to do. If you got through political purposes uh, a monopoly right to sell something, you could make a lot of money, but you also needed working capital to take advantage of it. So the guy who gets the, uh, the right to import wine, for example, from Spain into Elizabethan England, needs ships to get it there, needs, needs people to, to be involved in, in distributing it and you know, selling it. So obviously is going to enter into party, uh, in, into partnership with other people who can bring some of those resources, um, including financial resources. And so the creation of early companies we see arise to take advantage of these kind of favors which have some kind of military backing and they're normally won through a political process. So the impetus to the creation of the firm, uh, the company, which eventually we will explore further through this text, uh, very often has political roots. And it's really not until the 19th century that the um, freedom to create a company without direct permission and a clearly stated purpose and proved purpose by rulers of the day came to be uh, in much of the, uh, the world. The Roman examples were quite nascent ones, uh, and or in the terminology we can see some continuity into the, uh, the present day. Um, the Middle Ages um, disrupted many of the use of these Roman um, uh, innovations. And we turn, before I briefly turn to the Middle Ages, I'll uh, say a little bit here about some of the, uh, the overarching themes in this early stage of the, uh, the course here in Enterprise and Governance. Uh, critical thing is this interdependence of the political and the military. And we can talk about the state, but uh, the state has, a, has uh, uh, a sense of a greater order and stability and structure and institutionalization, uh, which is something that I think we can only really meaningfully talk about uh, from probably about the 17th to the 18th century. Uh, and people debate this this all the time. The modern state, where does that start? Some people would date it to the early 19th century, for example, um, with um, particularly much of the uh, the formalization of institutions, say with Napoleonic rule uh, in one way and a very different approach in the English way, both of them having quite formalized um, public services, civil service, for example. Um, even though, of course, we see in Napoleonic France um, a uh, highly uh, authoritarian uh, governance structure nonetheless based on the personality of Napoleon Bonaparte um, himself. But the broader point is that it's impossible to separate um, uh, the political uh, and in, in the crudest sense um, the capacity for 
inflicting violence in a systematic way, okay, uh, elites and uh, people who are engaged in business. Uh, because at very least, uh, even if you're flourishing in business, your stuff can be taken off you um, by the powerful people uh, of the day. Uh, one other concept that we will come back to repeatedly is the distinction between kind of public goods and private goods. Roads being a classic example of a public good, uh, that they are non-excludable. Uh, the Roman roads, for example, um, paved roads, uh, it wasn't possible to exclude people from using them. There are some, you know, highways in Japan, for example, that have barriers on them and you can only get in and out of them by paying a toll. Um, but of course, the, uh, the early roads in Europe, anyone could use them when Roman soldiers were not around and that was most of the time. Uh, so people could free ride off them. And this, is, this uh, is a core notion in economics, this notion of the public good. So it's facilities that everyone benefits from uh, that have the property of non-excludability, that you can't exclude people from the benefits of them. Uh, and so therefore it gives rise to free riding. Everyone benefits if a dam is built upstream, for example, and significantly reduces the chance of the village flooding. Um, everyone pref would prefer that their neighbor paid for the dam rather than they pay for them themselves. So this public goods notion immediately introduces an argument for state interventions uh, to force people to contribute to building uh, infrastructure that people uh, benefit from. Another theme that we're going to look at repeatedly is the cultural status of business. And of course, biz business, uh, when it goes well, brings wealth, prosperity, and prosperity brings a capacity for people to invest in contributing to their own societies, um, in sponsoring art, in sponsoring the building of mosques, of churches, of temples, for example, and this will enhance the status of business people. And of course, money buys, buys attention, okay? And uh, as a consequence, as businesses prosper, they are likely to bring the greater cultural uh, standing as well too. And this is a threat to old elite, old elites. But old elites are particularly dependent on, say, uh, early specification of property rights, the right to land, for example, backed up with authority uh, to exclude other people from, from those assets, you know, such as you know, grazing on their lands. Um, they, uh, on the one hand, benefit themselves from the, from the trading networks uh, that business people bring, but similarly feel uh, threatened by them. And this is an inherent tension. And we see this even today on the, uh, the conservative side of politics. In many countries, there are tensions between the old money, the old established, and in a sense, the pro-free markets, pro-entrepreneurship, often quite disruptive, uh, new business people that will arrive. So conservatism often is standing against new entrepreneurs in favor of once were entrepreneurs or entrenched, um, very often say people who benefit from uh, monopoly favors uh, from government. Uh, now, and there's also another challenge and it's not just from the wealthy, it's from the talented. Uh, talented individuals, uh, very often become ambitious. And over time, uh, this has become completely normalized. If, uh, when everyone goes to school, for example, and everyone's educated, and it's very clear that the best and brightest in the room uh, have a particular claim on some kind of leadership role, or want to make a contribution, they're obviously smarter <laughs> than others. And so old notions of them being of a particular class background or not born right become more and more difficult to bear. So societies, uh, if they are to um, retain a degree of stability, must have a mechanism for integrating talented individuals into the existing social order. Other th otherwise, they will become very uh, uh, effective forces for disruption, potentially explicitly a revolutionary uh, force. Uh, now, in terms of backlash against business people, we think of business people disrupting old elites, but of course, business people are invariably going to provoke anger against them. Um, 
So if you have to pay back a loan and the interest rate is high and it's put up higher, for example, um, or if you're a farmer and the merchant who buys your product then take it to market, pays you much less than you think is fair if they take a very large profit margin because they can arbitrage, because they have the exclusive access to the market. Um, all of those things are going to, to make people um, angry. Uh, there's an old expression in, in, in English, and the miller was a thief. So the owner of the mill, uh, who where the mill was where people would have their flour, the, uh, their grain, their wheat ground into flour. Um, of course, wheat itself is pretty useless unless it's ground into flour. Uh, so the, uh, the idea that you could be uh, held up by someone who provided a critical input into value adding, the supplier of the service of the milling became critical. And indeed we see in uh, a number of countries, uh, old elites uh, insisted on the right to have a monopoly ownership of the mill. And this was actually another mechanism of what we call rent extraction of effectively taxing people um, to access just a really basic uh, bit of infrastructure that they needed to turn their agricultural produce into, a, in, into something usable to actually you know, to feed themselves. And we see uh, when uh, there is lots of exploitation that we often get populist responses. Uh, one of the really striking things is uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, continuing resistance to the predations of Rome, of tax collecting, tax farming, uh, people who uh, living on their, um, in, for example, um, what is now uh, Israel and uh, Palestinian territories, uh, obviously living uh, quite precariously given the, uh, the environment, um, felt a heavy burden of taxation, injustice, and uh, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of unrest which actually manifest in, in uh, new religious movements. And we see particularly uh, Christianity became influential. Jesus Christ quite explicitly appealed to the poor. Um, the famous imagery of him um, going into the Jewish temple, Jerusalem. He thought that the, the uh, he was Jewish himself, of course. Um, but the, uh, the rulers of the Jewish temple were quite privileged and uh, he throws out the merchants and the money lenders um, as somehow desecrating both uh, the, uh, the temple of, of, of God um, and at the same time understanding that they were people uh, who were um, seen by many of the poorer people to be highly exploitative. So in a sense, it was, a, it was leading a kind of a populist in, in a religious sense to um, backlash against the established elites of the, uh, the Jewish faith um, who were in very close uh, cahoots uh, with the Roman rulers of the day. And of course, when Jesus gets crucified, you know, he's effectively um, arrested um, by the Jewish leaders, but they don't have a right to put him to death because it's Roman rule. And then they, they uh, petition uh, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor, and ask him to sentence him to death. Okay, uh, so many of the strands of the New Testament, the uh, the stories in the Bible, uh, and one reason why the uh, Christianity found such widespread influence is there is this actually quite radical element. Um, there uh, that taps frustration with the money lenders, um, ruthless merchants, and um, the rulers of the day who you know ex uh, uh, effectively suppressed uh, the locals. Um, but uh, there is also an edict um, in the New Testament as well. Um, recognizing that if you overly provoked uh, Rome, uh, it would be not be uh, a good thing to do. So the advice there was um, give um, give unto Caesar what is due to Caesar. Um, that's a that's a very rough summary of the Bible. So um, pay your tax to uh, the Roman Empire. Um, otherwise, they'll come and uh, terrorize us. Okay. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, serve your own, own community and be true to your religious faith. Now, later on, um, 
This strand in Christianity gets picked up in the Quran with the Prophet Muhammad and explicitly uh, prohibits usury, that is the charging of interest on loans. And the practice of Islamic banking uh, is uh, designed explicitly uh, for Muslims to be able to access finance without um, breaching this prohibition in the Quran um, on interest-bearing loans. So later on, interestingly, the Catholic Church in medieval Europe becomes the, uh, the single largest enterprise, without doubt, uh, for various reasons, um, particularly if you died without uh, an heir. Your, all your assets would go to the church, for example, in a number of countries. So the church becomes incredibly powerful. Um, but despite that, the church often gets itself into debt uh, to moneylenders. And it was sometimes very convenient for the church itself to refer to these biblical teachings saying, you know, that you should be char char charging interest rates um, on your loans to the church. So... Uh, being an extraordinarily profligate um, uh, borrower, uh, it often reached back into a um, biblical rationale for effectively um, at least defaulting on its interest payments, if not its uh, capital. So a broader point here is about the stories people tell. Um, and uh, Harari, uh, the brilliant scholar of uh, the book Sapiens, talks a lot about um, our imagined, uh, the, imagine, the imagined institutions of our market system. You know, the faith that we have, for example, in, in paper money, which is an interesting thing we will we'll come back to uh, later on. Um, but there are broader points here too about the, uh, the stories we tell ourselves uh, in terms of the way we organize uh, enterprise and whether it's more or less uh, legitimate. There are themes that I will pick up on. Uh, one recurrent theme throughout economic history is predation. Uh, people stealing your stuff. Military elites, rising rival kingdoms, pirates, bandits, always presented threats to business endeavor. This has led to a quite significant rethinking in, in history, in economic, historical, in economic history in particular, about the positive role of empire. Now, we hear a lot of criticism in, in again, recently in, in politics, in political domain, particularly in the context of the very important and valuable Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of criticism of imperialism. And I will come back to these issues and this book shows, for example, that um, some of the instances of early companies were involved in um, the South Sea bubble, for example, which I'll give you a short video on, um, were involved in the slave trade, for example, so there are some truly odious elements of imperialism. However, one thing that we know is that when the Roman Empire was at its peak, when Rome could project military authority, and subsequently when we see other empires that brought a degree of uh, peace order, we see greater trade and we see greater prosperity. So as Mark Rowe, the Harvard University uh, scholar who will refer to right at the end of the course in terms of comparative uh, corporate governance, um, he speaks of peace as predicate. So for prosperity in market systems, peace uh, really does help. Um, mind you, wars, wars sometimes can be a short-term boost to, an, to economies, but Domestically, you need the peace, okay? Um, effectively, what we see is military expansion to kind of protect trade, but also to be able to tax it as well. And uh, one of the recurrent themes is smuggling, people trying to get past the tax uh, collectors that used to strategically set themselves up on major roads at junction points, for example. Um, we see this, uh, if you go to Hakone, um, the old Tokaido, there was a checkpoint, of course, for people approaching Edo, um, and the Bakfu, the shogunate officials, could check people's um, identity and see how they were moving there. But this was also a mechanism to make sure that people weren't smuggling, they weren't, they weren't carrying goods um, and avoiding uh, necessary uh, taxes, for example. Now, one of the other things we, we see recurrently with any society, larger society, is who's in and who's not. In the sense, who's a citizen or not a citizen? Who has the right to reside or not? Um, and we'll see that over time this notion of citizenship which devolves, which, which comes from the Latin notion of the citta or the citta, the city in the first place, 
Um, this often brought implications about how much tax people had to pay. Uh, we see, for example, in um, Muslim lands, um, particularly, for example, in the Greater Ottoman Empire, um, minorities who are not Muslim are often protected by the rulers of the day, and there was, there was considerable diversity in, in uh, Muslim societies, and, and, and even today. Um, for example, there are still, even in Iran, there's small Jewish communities, for example. In, in the Middle East, uh, there, were, there were many uh, minority Jewish communities. Um, but with the status of protected minorities, they very often had to pay a tax for this. Um, so if you paid a very special tax, you had a right to maintain your non-believer status and your presence. And uh, one of the stories of uh, the Jewish experience in Western Europe is this never-ending vulnerability, the danger of being expelled. For example, as happened to all the Jewish residents um, of Moscow in midwinter in the late 19th century, um, a quite dreadful uh, expulsion. The person who was responsible for that later on, by chance, was blown up by Russian revolutionaries. So um, uh, maybe there is a little bit of kind of uh, poetic justice in history uh, at times. Um, but one of the significant things is that vulnerable minority communities uh, were very much focused on having uh, n networks extended beyond where they lived as a refuge, as support if they had to leave, if they had to escape. They also wanted assets that were mobile, a critical thing. And one of the most significant uh, assets that people invested in was something that just couldn't be taken off them, education. And so this helps to explain the particular orientation in culture towards um, uh, specialist knowledge, high levels of educational attainment in things like medicine and whatnot, um, and law, of course, um, in Jewish communities in uh, Western uh, Europe. Uh, generally, that's part of the migrant, the vulnerable migrant experience and creating informal networks uh, that often transcend as well um, borders of the day. And so, so many uh, significant uh, long distance trading networks relied on uh, elements of networks of trust uh, that might be underpinned by a common identity, uh, whether it was the Arab traders uh, who were trading right through the Indian Ocean right down into um, what were the, uh, the East Indies and now contemporary Indonesia and Malaysia, or whether it was the Jewish traders throughout uh, Western Europe. So typically your medieval rulers, they drew wealth from passing agriculture, uh, from, sorry, from agriculture around them and passing trade. And they were fortified in their castles. This is Carcassonne in uh, southwestern France, uh, a remarkable place if you get a chance to visit. Um, and um, infrastructure was reinforced about this. So they would invest, of course, in, in uh, road and roads and maintaining security along the roads um, to try and attract traders to come along there. And in return, they would be able to tax the uh, traders. And we see uh, that's where some of the critical overland networks happen. Um, but in the Middle Ages, um, significant parts of trading network uh, were water-based, and particularly the rise of the Hanseatic uh, League, which was centered on the, uh, the Baltic in particular, but reaches up to, uh, to Bergen in uh, Norway. Uh, very significant networks. And we see joining ups of, of different regional networks. So goods get carried a certain way and then plugged into them. Uh, so this is uh, by, by other trading networks. This is the case in the 19th century, even into the 20th century, for example, when um, Western traders did business in Southeast Asia, for example, where they secured uh, exports for European American markets and whatnot, they often tapped local trading networks. And so um, merchants became bridges between different uh, merchants from far further afield. So there was kind of a, an element of regional specialization. This particular map actually captures this here. Um, we, out of Italy, uh, Genova, uh, and which is closer to France, if we look, see Milan there, um, on one side of the, the top of the Italian boot, on the, the left-hand side, okay, um, on the, um, uh, 
the uh, western side and on the eastern side, Venice, okay, uh, they, they were rivals at times, but they often very much uh, cooperated as well. And uh, they would use sea trade, and which extended all the way up to um, Britain, and then the um, Hanseatic League um, trading networks would then connect with them. So this on trading element. The Silk Road worked in a similar kind of way, um, and we'll, we'll finish up with that. Um, the Hanseatic lead is particularly interesting because this was a highly formalized, over time, more and more formalized mechanism uh, for uh, trust. Uh, it was like, in some sense, a, mul a, um, uh, well, a, a multi-stakeholder, multinational enterprise. I'm thinking uh, it's, 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 it's um, kind, of, kind of like a, um, uh, a partnership, a partnership of partnerships uh, with common language being German and common uh, contracting practices, accounting practices, mechanisms, for example, uh, for trade to underpin trade finance, letters of credit. It had basic quasi firm structures. Uh, this is the great meeting house of the Hansa League in Bergen in Norway. This is a, an ancient building, one of the, one of the, uh, the oldest um, original intact um, wooden structures associated with the Hansa League throughout um, northern uh, Europe. Um, the relationship between religion and trade uh, is always a compl complicated one. The church was the largest landholder in Western Europe, for example. They felt quite threatened, potentially, um, because, uh, for example, Venice uh, was so affluent and was actually governed effectively as a republic, and of course it uh, um, had a very close relationship with the Catholic Church, being a Catholic country, uh, but it became um, a, quite a significant source of authority in its own right, and um, it had so many financial resources that it could pay for merchant armies uh, for, for um, uh, uh, effectively contract soldiers uh, to work for them. Its own citizens didn't really need to serve in the military. They, they could um, outsource that. Um, so effectively, the development of early companies uh, was a, in another round of this and on a much larger scale in the late medieval era, uh, era is to take advantage of greater long distance trade. And um, an important question here more generally is the role of infrastructure, uh, obviously port infrastructure and whatnot. But I also want to emphasize that, as I mentioned about with water, um, water uh, provided such a uh, an efficient mechanism for transporting goods over great distances that rulers very often mobilized people um, to literally make the water go further and even better to be able to make it possible to go upstream um, and had literally have the water flow uphill. Okay, uh, This is actually near Car uh, Carcassonne as well, a series of locks. Um, where you could actually, it, it works uh, as the Panama and the Suez Canal work, for example, uh, so that you can actually literally uh, drain the water um, and fill, fill another level, and so that you could refloat a vessel, rise it to a higher level, and so literally you could climb upwards uh, just th simply through allowing the water to flow to, uh, to equalize. Okay, but this of course needed to, uh, you need to mobilize a lot of people, um, in order to finance and coordinate the construction of this infrastructure. And uh, China and England, for example, uh, had hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of canals that were created uh, to take advantage of these, uh, the effects of uh, water transport. Um, long distance sea trade, uh, particularly when it extends out to the East Indies, for example, um, uh, to India, extraordinarily risky, expensive, potentially very profitable, and it needed risk sharing. Uh, the Merchant of Venice tells a tale, of course, of the ships that don't come in and the, and the fight that arises uh, from it. Uh, the textbook talks a lot about the drivers of long distance trade. Um, effectively, we see that trade and trading ports shape cities and shape societies. This is Bergen. Uh, these buildings are mostly late 19th century, except for se several of them are much, much older, many centuries older. Um, many of them uh, were built later 19th century, but in a very Hanseatic kind of style. Uh, and by the way, right, 
right there in the picture there. Um, second from the left is the best fish restaurant I've ever been to in my life. If you get to Bergen, go there and have the fish soup. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, actually, uh, Norway doesn't get its independence until um, mm, mm, 1908. Um, but with the rise of uh, a distinctive Norwegian identity, uh, some of the architectural legacies, the style, the building of, uh, uh, of, of a new visuality, a spatial visuality, architectural visuality, um, for, a, for an aspiring independent Norway, actually referenced um, architecture from the Hansa League, which is all a little bit kind of ironic, um, given, of course, the, uh, the German element um, historically there in the Middle Ages. So we see the rise of companies to exploit um, either state-sponsored monopolies, as I've touched on, or great trading opportunities. So the most famous is the Dutch East India Company, and you've got um, some links to a documentary on this on the website. And um, sometimes uh, this was seen as a very powerful tool for national rulers to, as a mechanism to assert power. Uh, we see this, the East India Company, the British East India Company, um, actually becomes, uh, uh, has more people working for it in terms of military capability than the British Army as a whole at one point. And uh, this is something we'll explore and the textbook talks about this further. Um, a critical thing is when you're taking advantage of monopolies though, and to create companies you needed the authority of the crown, this could provoke host hostility uh, for people at home from those not favored with monopolies. And this is an important point um, when we think about uh, imperialism. Some people at home, at the centre of the empire, did well. You know, the, the English expression, made out like a bandit. Uh, some people did extraordinarily well. Other people were left out um, of those endeavours. And so they were all, it was always contentious um, at home as well, particularly who, who gained from this. Another element is this relationship with religion. Um, it, many critics of imperialism will say that to some degree it was a, um, it was a, a Christianizing project when we talk about West, Western uh, colonialism, imperialism. Um, certainly um, the two went hand in hand. Uh, merchants who made a lot of money from trade, for example, um, obviously wanted to claim a higher mission. And we see Antwerp as a striking example. This Antwerp was, was uh, uh, in, in Belgium, uh, uh, very early, very significant uh, center of long distance trade. And the merchants of Antwerp um, put a lot of money in back into the city, uh, building churches. Um, I believe that, that was uh, Giotti, I think, a um, very famous Italian sculptor, um, uh, very rare work. Um, which was really about merchants saying that, okay, yes, I've got fabulously rich through this, but I'm giving something back uh, to society. And we see when we talk about the United States in the 19th century, that very strikingly, some of the, uh, the great um, business uh, moguls, some of the wealthiest people there, uh, the likes of Andrew Carnegie, for example, put a lot of their money back into society through charitable endeavors. Another thing is the um, uh, very nascent uh, democracy emerges from some of these city-states, uh, and particularly in the Low Countries, particularly in um, the Netherlands, as we understand it today, um, they resisted uh, monarchical rule from elsewhere. Genova as well earlier, we mentioned, was a republic. Um, so this notion that the merchants, or the or the uh, um, sorry, the citizens, the, the residents of the city, um, were a particular class of residents, not everyone was treated as such, um, had, a, had an important role to play in governance. And very often their stature in the city was related to, of course, their financial um, stature. So while there may have been systematic exploitation further afield, um, some of the wealth that was generated through long distance uh, trade led to, interestingly, the rise of quasi-liberal and quasi-democratic um, societies within these merchant cities. Uh, we see Amsterdam, for example, becomes a very significant um, place uh, for publishing critical books uh, by people who are kind of on the run from rulers in other um, European countries, for example. And it was, it was, it was significantly a safe haven. 
Um, sometimes money flowed into um, education as well. The University of Leiden, um, one of Wasseter's partners, um, benefited enormously from Leiden being a uh, major center of international trade. Still Leiden University um, has some of the best resources and, and uh, um, very much invested in research into East Asian studies, which is a legacy from, from the early days of um, Dutch uh, long distance trade, subsequent um, imperialism as well. So critical things here in terms of the relationship between um, trade and culture. Uh, Effectively, the, as I say here, the incentives, practice and products of trade brought people of very diverse backgrounds in contact with each other. Okay? Um, cultures are syncretic and trade was a key driver of this. Okay? There are so many instances we can talk about this and, and we will do as well. Okay? Um, at the same time, trade also affirms difference. It makes people aware of their particular living, their values, their living, their, their, their language, for example. And we see often merchants become champions of um, local language as as well their own their own language say so Dutch and being educated in Dutch and and, and um, praying in Dutch rather than Latin for example um, which is, a, is an element of a strong element of the uh, the vernacular in a Protestant turn um, organized enterprises create and perpetuate their own culture there was a very clear culture associated with the Hansa League later on with the the Dutch merchants and the Dutch East India Company for example um, also, with the, the scaling up of business, you need more and more people who can work as clerks, uh, who can write, who are literate, um, and to have a decent supply of workers. We see uh, in, in this modern organization, we see that merchants start to favor the rise of mass education, of public education. And um, so the growth of education very much follows the demands of business for more educated workers. And um, as the scale of enterprise grows, the ability to share risk grows, uh, trade can extend over great distances. But that's not to say that trade, of course, in much earlier periods didn't happen. And the story of the Silk Road um, profoundly shows this, that you could have merchants connecting uh, with all along the Silk Road and goods can pass through through many hands. Um, and I've got some, some details uh, specifically here. What's interesting is um, the imaginative role, and we keep story, talking about the stories we tell, tell ourselves. Um, China's influence on the West um, through the Silk Road um, is part of, of course of China's self-imagining and helps us to think about um, Chinese understanding with the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, that uh, large parts of the world, which have very much have been um, marginalized in economic development over, over a number of decades, um, China can imagine with, with new infrastructure uh, may be uh, integrated into new uh, trading uh, networks. And that's something we'll touch on again. So. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the politics of trade history, okay? Um, particularly imperialism has a bad rap, uh, but some of the most prosperous periods in human history are when empires were actually relatively stable. And the telling of the history of China is very much this is one as one as well. Um, that uh, when China was internally divided at war, uh, large numbers of people suffered uh, gravely. So when China was unified under stable rule, um, China is much more prosperous, and China is a very clear exhibit um, of where, in a sense, imperialism can have positive uh, elements. Um, so, in in short, uh, history uh, can tell us a lot. Um, history itself is very much contested, though, because it can be turned uh, for political purposes, and we will see that when we talk about um, particular national case studies. Uh, and the stories we tell ourselves in terms of the particularity of um, each country's market system.